Welcome to Economics and Beyond. I'm Rob Johnson, President of the Institute for New Economic Thinking. I'm here today with Dr. Peter Bofinger of Wurzburg University. He has been for most of the last 15 years on the Council of Economic Experts. They used to call the Five Wise Men, though now it's inhabited by many women as well. And uh, he is also a commissioner on the Institute for New Economic Thinking Commission on Global Economic Transformation. Peter, thanks for joining me today. Yeah, thank you for giving me the opportunity to have this podcast with you. Well, there's an awful lot going on. There's an awful lot of uh, very, very stressful things that uh, at one level are daunting, but another level are an opportunity to reopen the, uh, the question about how we organize society and the role of markets and economy in, how you say, making for a prosperous future. Uh, we've, with the coronavirus 19 panic and uh, the responses that you see, I guess I'm, I'm just curious, wide open. What, what are your observations? What do you see being done wrong in some places? What do you see being done right? What's missing? What would you like to see? Well, first of all, I think it's important to make an assessment of what's going on. And just today, the IMF came out with its World Economic Outlook uh, and its forecasts and assessment of the global economy. And uh, I would say the anal analysis of the IMF is, is very negative. I think what they present is a kind of economic tsunami, which is hitting the global economy. Uh, according to the IMF, this is the worst recession uh, since the Second World War. And the forecasts uh, of, of the IMF uh, for the most important countries uh, are really terrible. So minus almost minus 6% for the US, minus 7.5% for the euro area. Uh, world output shrinks by 3%. World trade goes down by 11%. And at the same time, unemployment rates will be going up uh, very in a very severe way, in the US unemployment will increase from 7.7 to 10.4 percent. In Spain, uh, from 14 percent to more than 20 percent. So it's a, it's a really frightening picture that uh, the IMF is, has now has now presented. And um, well, how to deal with it? I think right now um, global leaders and politicians are also a little bit overwhelmed by the dynamics. Uh, of this pandemic, I think four weeks ago, eight weeks ago, uh, the, the hope was it, it won't be that that bad, and now we see it's it's really really bad, and maybe it's getting even worse. And uh, already now, uh, the IMF expect is expecting that uh, most countries will have huge fiscal deficits for the US. Uh, they are expecting a deficit deficit of of fifteen percent in two thousand twenty. Uh, for the euro area, minus seven percent. So uh, this this uh, tsunami is also really making a, it has a terrible effect on, on 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 public finances. So how far can one assess what what has been done by the governments all over the world? I would say they have really been relatively fast. They have been willing to extend relatively large support uh, to the to the economy to the real sectors of the economy. I think overall, um, uh, the governments have been uh, giving guarantees uh, to, to small and medium-sized companies that they can somehow get loans from the banking system. In, in a lot of countries, uh, the government have supported companies to reduce their, their wage bill by what we call in Germany, short-time uh, work. Um, there is also, uh, in many countries, uh, Companies are no longer uh, have to have to have to make payments for for taxes. So, so there's a kind of tax deferrals. So overall, I think the first reaction was relatively strong, relatively forceful, um, and um, I think it now remains to be seen uh, how to to deal with the with the further consequences. I think so far that has been some kind of first aid support. I would say to to keep the economies from collapsing. But now, as we see. Uh, that the crisis will be relatively prolonged. Uh, we are coming in a kind of second stage, so where we have to have to 
find I think more more um, intensive um, support and and in principle you can compare the the situation of the economic system in this kind of the shutdown period to a kind of artificial coma for the economic system and during this artificial coma it's the role of the governments to support the economic system in a way that once the shutdown is over once the economic system is getting out of this artificial coma that the damages are as small as possible and as i said the first support mechanism is liquidity support and I think that has been provided in an ample way. But if the shutdown goes on, and I think that's what it looks like, in addition to the liquidity support, what is really needed is now also some kind of solvency support. And to explain this a little bit, I think the, the problem of the crisis, the longer, longer it lasts, is that debt is built up in the economic system. You have, uh, you have firms in the service sector and the production sector their revenues are going down, but they still have to make fixed payments, not only for wages, there's possibility to reduce wage payments somehow, but they have to make payments for leases, for rents, for leasing, for interest, for principal. So they have still these fixed payments. And as long as you have to, uh, on the one hand, you have declining revenues and fixed payments, of course, your debt burden goes up. And and the problem and the challenge for the for the governments is now somehow to relieve the production and service sector from this debt burden. Because otherwise, if if this debt burden remains in the private sector, of course, it will then translate from the production service sector to the real estate sector, to the banking system, then we will get a full-blown banking crisis, which threatens the whole financial system. And so the challenge for the government is now somehow to relieve uh, the production service sector from this debt burden and this relief you can also you can also call it kind of balance sheet repair cannot be done with guarantees cannot be done with liquidity support this relief requires uh, solvency support and i think this is still missing i think even in germany where we have this bazooka so our finance minister and economics minister they are very proud uh, of having this bazooka which is a very ample uh, and, and generous liquidity support but it does not help to repair the balance sheets. And so in this second stage, the question is now, how do we uh, provide the solvency support, how far governments are willing and able to provide this solvency support. But, but it's obvious uh, if this solvency support is not provided, the debt burden uh, is piling up in the production service sector. It will then go to the banking system and then it will destroy the banks. And in the end, the government has to come up anyhow for this for this debt burden, therefore, uh, the, in, in my view, it's 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 better to act timely to 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 help the production service sector with this kind of solvency support instead of waiting. But um, this this is now, as, as I said, a kind of second stage of 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 the support, uh, which is still not very very far developed. And and I think many governments, I think in Germany. They, have, they still hope they don't have to do it because liquidity support is not so much a, a, a burden for for the for the government. Uh, uh, while while solvency uh, support requires direct transfers, negative taxes, which of course has a direct effect on the uh, on the deficit uh, of 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 the government. So you're kind of seeing a. Uh what you might call a chain. I've looked at your uh, recent coronavirus uh, PowerPoint uh, presentation for CEPR. Uh, a coronavirus crisis, now is the hour of modern monetary theory. I'll try to attach that, uh, a copy of that to our website. But I, I watch the flow, which you might call the sequence of balance sheet trauma that emanates, I guess what, where. Is, is the starting point where workers are asked to stay home and therefore uh, if they get laid off or wa their wages, the businesses close down, uh, accompanying their going home, and then it starts to propagate through to things like mortgage payments or uh, just... The, the losses in earnings in corporations that moves to the financial sector. Where where should they intervene? How soon should they intervene? Well, uh, they, 
they should intervene yeah. as early in the chain as possible. Yeah, so I think one instrument that were very helpful and that we see in Germany, but I think also in, in, in Austria and in some other countries, uh, is short time work, which means that uh, the firms can reduce the, the time for which they pay workers and the loss of income to the worker due to the reduced working time is compensated in Germany by 60% by the government. So this is really helpful because companies have to pay less wages, so their, their fixed payments are reduced. At the same time, the loss of income, which normally would, would, would come because of the reduced working time, is compensated by the government. So you maintain somehow the purchasing power of the workers, and at the same time, uh, there is a relief um, for the firms from their fixed uh, uh, wage payments. I think that's a very useful instrument and in Germany. Uh, it has also been applied with a lot of success in the during the financial crisis in 2009. So in Germany, we had the remarkable situation that in 2009, although our output declined by 5%, you could hardly see an increase in unemployment because all the, the buffer that is needed uh, was provided by this short time work procedure. I think that's a very, very useful instrument. And but of course, it's costly because the government has to come up uh, for the reduced working time and has to just to provide 60% uh, compensation to the workers uh, for their for their loss of income due to the reduced working time. And do you uh, how do I say do you do you think that people are politically sensitive now in the sense that uh, in 2008, 9, and 10, in many places, particularly the United States, there was a lot of acrimony associated with the distribution of where the payments went. The, the famous quote by Joseph Stiglitz, the polluters got paid and everyone else suffered. Uh, in this instance, I, I don't see it as quite like a financial crisis. But is there a lot of controversy in Germany at this point or in Europe about the, how you say the points of intervention and the distributional consequences? Well, so far, I think there is broad consensus that at least the short time work is the right thing to do. I think the more critical discussion will come up uh, if one discusses uh, how much support you will give to the medium-sized, smaller companies, uh, how much transfers they get from from the government. Uh, and of course, that, the question will be, is it the right thing to give so much money to, to companies just to, to keep them alive? But um, I think one also has to be careful that to not, not to compare uh, the present situation 100% uh, with the financial crisis. I think in the financial crisis, banks had huge problems because they made lots of mistakes. Yeah? And, um, and of course, then the, 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 the idea is that they should have felt, uh, felt the pain. Um, and, and I also, with all due respect to Joe Stiglitz, I would say the narrative that the banks did not suffer uh, in, this, in this great financial crisis is also not really correct because the stock prices of banks uh, were declined tremendously. So the bank owners, uh, they made huge losses until now. If you compare the share prices of German banks to the share prices in 2007, there were huge losses. So anyhow, but today, if companies get support or need support from the government, it's not because they have made wrong decisions because their business models uh, were not successful, they make losses because the government has decided to close down businesses in order to safeguard public health. So it's a public purpose for which this shutdown is, is uh, implemented. And as a consequence, one should say, well, uh, if, if companies suffer for the public good of, of pre preventing uh, uh, the spreading of, of, of a disease, they would deserve a kind of, of compensation from society. Uh, and but but I think it's this view is not widely shared in Germany and I'm also not sure uh, whether 
that, that there will be enough support for for companies in order to survive during during this crisis. When uh, you you made your PowerPoint presentation, you talked a great deal about the uh, the notion of modern monetary theory. If it all flows back to the central bank in the end, and uh, how would I put it? Uh, they, they can either monetize or debt finance things. It's still the collective responsibility of the entire society. What role does modern monetary theory play in your thinking right now? Well, so I think we have to realize that this tsunami will create a huge amount of debt, whether we like it or not. And this amount of debt will be there. And the question is, where can this amount of debt be stored in a way that it has the least costs for society? Uh, you can have the debt burden in the, in, the, in the real economy, you can have the debt burden in the banking system, and both is not a good idea. You can have the debt burden in the government sector. And I think the idea of modern monetary theory is that you shift this debt burden in the final instance from the government to the central banks. That is, the idea is that the central banks are the institution who are in the best position to deal with this debt burden, to put this debt burden on the balance sheets. I think that's, that's the logic uh, uh, of MMT as, as I see it. And if you look at the financial crisis in 2008, 2009, in effect, that's the way it was handled. Uh, in the financial crisis, the debt burden was mainly in the banking system. And what the governments did, especially in the United States, they took the debt burden out of the banking system on the balance sheet of the government, providing the banks uh, with, with, with equity in exchange. The government also got, got a kind of share in, in, the, in the bank balance sheet. And then the, what, what did the government do with the debt burden? Well, it transferred it to the central bank, not directly, but in the form of quantitative easing, where the central bank was gradually buying up all the debt from the government and putting it in, in its balance sheet. And more or less the same thing you can see, could see in other, in other countries and in Japan, uh, you can observe this for, for many years until now that the government is having a relatively high deficit to somehow to sustain the economy and the, the central bank is piling up huge amounts of government debt. So right now, the share, the, the, the amount of, of government debt in the Bank of Japan's balance sheet uh, relative to GDP is 90%. In the United States, it's 25%. In the ECB, it's also 25%. So Japan is really the, uh, the paradigm uh, for, for modern monetary theory, where the really the the central bank is financing the government. It's not directly financing the government, but more or less directly. So the government issues bonds, the banks buy the bonds on the primary market, and then on the secondary market, the Bank of Japan buys these bonds. So modern monetary theory, as I see it in the present situation, is simply the idea we have this inevitable increase of the debt burden. and in order to survive economically, uh, this debt burden has to be passed to the institution which is most able to deal with it. In my view, this is central bank. Of course, many people now say, okay, there's a risk with this uh, financing of the government by the central bank. And I, I'm still surprised that prominent Keynes, Keynesian economists like uh, Rogoff or Summers or Krugman criticize uh, MMT so heavily. Uh, and, and of course, their main argument is if you have excessive debt financing by the government, then it leads to inflation. But I think uh, it all depends on excessive. Of course, if you do things in excessive way, they're always damaging. So, so if you uh, think about drinking habits, I think excessive drinking is always a bad thing and you don't, don't need very much uh, scientific evidence for this. And the same way with MMT, if you have excessive debt financing, of course, it has negative effects. But 
right now it's not about excessive it's about uh, the amount of debt financing by central bank that is required somehow to stabilize uh, our our economies to get the debt burden out of the private sector into the central bank balance sheet and as this debt financing is just filling a gap uh, in the private sector repairing simply balance sheets in the private sector this is not inflationary yeah? it's just just on the opposite it's, pre it's preventing an inflation uh, it's preventing deflation it's preventing an, an implosion of the whole economic system that would occur without this government support and so it's definitely not inflationary as uh, mmt critics tend to argue of course, when you are in, a, in an equilibrium situation where the economy is doing well, where we have full capacity utilization, and if in this situation the government says, okay, I want to spend 10 or 20 percent more and I finance it with the central bank, of course, this will lead to inflation. So, like in medicine, it depends on the diagnosis and it also depends on the dose. And as we know from Paracelsus, it's the dose that makes the poison and um, a well find uh, well and timely dosed uh, central bank financing in the present situation is in my view the only the only therapy that works so we should should, should be very clear uh, of this so if if we if we don't allow this to this this transfer of debt from the private sector into the central bank balance sheet it it will be a real disaster it's already a disaster <laughs> But we somehow can deal with the disaster if we do it in this way. Yeah. Well, I sense, uh, first of all, the, the idea after 2008 that there is scarcity. I remember the acrimony in the United States on both sides, you know, both Republican and Democrat, which was they got all the money in the world to bail out the banks. But all of the states and localities had to lay off policemen, close hospitals, increase class size in schools because, quote, in the downturn, no one could afford it. And there was a movement on the right in the United States uh, led by Ron Paul about taking away the independence of the central bank because he said at the time, these guys are picking winners and the winners are all in the financial sector. Now, one can say, I think, uh, in tension with that, that if you let the financial system collapse, it takes the whole real economy down with it. And so going to that point of intervention made some sense in 2008. But this whole tension about picking winners and the use of scarcity in an MMT-like world is, is a very different or a difficult argue, argument to make as to where the constraints lie. Some of the people I know who are very uh, positive about MMT tell me that uh, where they think the tension or the instability is, is when one nation engages in it and another doesn't, and the implications therefore being for the foreign exchange market, that the currencies uh, appreciate where they uh, maintain the scarcity notion and where they use uh, extraordinary measures the, the currency depreciates and we end up into kind of a mercantilist uh, battle shifting the burden of deflation. How, how do you see all of that? Does that, does that, uh, well, I, I, I would, a concern? I would say the exchange rate argument is also one of the main criticisms against MMT. So they, the, the critics say, well, if you have, uh, if you have MMT, you get a depreciation and you get a currency crisis. But the current situation, I think this doesn't apply because all, all economies, big ones, small ones, advanced ones, not so advanced ones, have the problem that they have huge deficits. And so if they are able to monetize it, so they all have the same, same situation. So there's no, would be no uh, reason for, for that, that MMT is a threat to the stability of, of a currency. If, if all major economies act in the same way. Uh, and I think the US, the US, US will do some kind of, of MMT. They will not call it like this, but, but it's obvious if you have 15% deficit 
uh, in, in 2020 that somehow the Fed will buy up uh, the, the treasuries, there will be no doubt about. In Japan, they will do the same thing, they will do it in, uh, in, in the UK. And in the Eurozone, the same thing will also happen to some degree. The uh, ECB has, has announced its PEP uh, pandemic uh, purchase program. Uh, so all the central banks will do it in a way. They will not call it MMT because many, many observers uh, dislike, dislike this, this term and they don't want to see it that clearly. But that's, that's how it will be going on. The uh, Green New Deal and the role of MMT was a big uh, feature of the dialogue over the last few months prior to the onset of the pandemic. Uh, uh, in particular, I remember at the World Economic Forum this year, there was a lot of discussion about, uh, which you might say, the, the need to massively transform the energy industry and get on with meeting the goals of the IPCC and others about stopping, uh, reducing carbon and stopping the rise in temperatures. And many people saw MMT as a complement with an E uh, to that process. Do you see the uh, question now with the pandemic, will this accelerate the move toward what I'll call institutional transformation and embracing of climate? Or do you think people will be exhausted from the fear of the pandemic, the balance sheets all loaded up from uh, carrying the debt that the recession, uh, pandemic-related recession has created? And I guess the other question is, is there scope, if that recession is prolonged, to use energy transformation as the equivalent of a new deal to stimulate the economy, transform the nature of jobs, get people back to work and, and contribute to the recovery. Yeah, it can go both ways. Uh, a negative scenario would be that inevitably debt levels will go up, public, public debt levels will go up and um, conservatives will say, okay, now we had this um, huge increase of debt and now the most important thing is to reduce debt levels i think in germany uh we, this discussion has already started it's funny uh, so there's still already economists who say well it's very important that all the additional debt that is incurred now during the crisis has to be paid paid back uh, and so in germany we have this famous debt break which is in our constitution and this debt break says okay in a situation like today, where there are emergencies outside the control of the government, there's no problem uh, to have to have large deficits. But uh, all the additional debt incurred due to such a, a crisis has to be paid back within a reasonable period of time. So in Germany, we're just starting about uh, this uh, payback situation, and of course, that's that's Nick would be the really negative outcome that we have these uh, higher debt levels and for the next 10 years uh, we have to, to have to pay back all all this debt and there's no money uh, even less money is available for ecological transformation and all that stuff so that would be the negative scenario the positive scenario could be uh, that people wake up and and realize uh, all these doctrines about balanced budgets, about black zeros, as we call it in Germany, of debt breaks, realize this, these are only doctrines which have no scientific foundation. The same applies to the famous 60% debt threshold uh, in the Maastricht Treaty, uh, so which, which had absolutely no, uh, no academic background, which has no evidence. Uh, and, and overall, uh, if, if one looks at all the fiscal rules uh, that are floating around, there's almost no evidence for that. So you, of course, know this famous article by Reinhard and Rogoff uh, saying, okay, 90% uh, is the maximum debt level that, that countries can, 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 can bear. And then, of course, it was it was found out it's all it's all nonsense. The, the calculations were flawed. So the, the positive approach could be that people realize all these doctrines have no sound sound 
academic uh, scientific basis and let's think about fiscal policy in an open way and Abba Lerner, he's the father, was a father of uh, MMT and the father of what is called functional economics, he said, do not forget about these doctrines, ask about the effects of fiscal policy and, and getting rid of these doctrines would be a wonderful opportunity to, to ask, well, what are the challenges that we have once the shutdown is over? What are the challenges in terms of green transformation? And, and what can we do, how can we use fiscal deficits and central bank financing in a way to achieve these, these targets? And what are, and I think, the, the main uh, message of, of MMT is there are no financial constraints for large economies. There are real resource constraints, of course. And you have to, to have to respect the real resource constraints, otherwise you get inflation. Uh, but in, if, if you have this ecological transformation, you can ask, should not ask what, you should not, not take these this fiscal rules as an imperative, uh, but instead you should ask if we, if, we, if we finance very comprehensive programs to transform our economies, where are the real resource constraints which could, could lead to inflation? I think that would be a kind of scientific way to, to approach it. And so that's my hope. The positive thing is that, that people uh, realize a little bit that these fiscal rules are, are some, something like the emperor's new clothes. It's just, uh, they're just myths uh, and narratives, but which have no substance and to get rid of them uh, would be a major, would, would be one really positive effect of this corona crisis. Let, let me ask you about the European Union. Because, you know, in the United States, we have a common monetary policy, common banking regulation, and fiscal transfers, in other words, a, a centralized and nationwide fiscal system. So if something bad happens in Texas, you can, how would I say, draw on the entire body politic to support the uh, lo local conditions that are dire in one region, say in Texas. Uh, in Europe, migration is not quite as free as within the United States. The fiscal transfers are not complete. You're kind of in an intermediate zone as a system. And then this enormous pressure from the pandemic comes down on it. Does, is, is there a risk of the European Union breaking up as a result of these, yeah, yeah. Of these challenges? Yeah, you're raising a very important point. Um, so, first of all, uh, countries like Italy and Spain are very severely hit by the crisis. So, for Italy, the projected uh, GDP decline this year is minus 9.1%. For Spain, it's minus 8.0%. So, they're even more uh, affected by the crisis than other other economies. And, and now, if we talk about MMT, uh, you always have to take into account MMT is a recipe for relatively large, relatively closed economic areas. So when you are a very small country, MMT doesn't work. And now in the euro area, we have the problem that, is that, that you raise, that we have a common currency, but we don't have a federal level, and we do not have federal bonds, which would be there to finance uh, all the member states in an MMT-like way. So we still have the national uh, member states would have their national debt and have to they have to try to raise uh, funds on the capital markets uh, in their own responsibility and so this so the conditions for a well functioning well functioning MMT uh, financing are not existent uh, in the euro area and that makes the euro area extremely vulnerable uh, to this to this uh, corona crisis and you could already see it uh, after uh, the great financial crisis where uh, you had this main recession in 2009 that affected uh, all, all economies in the world. And then you had a kind of second uh, recession in the Eurozone 2011, 2012, 2013, which was due to the fact that the countries had to raise money uh, on their own account, the member states, they had, didn't, did not have the federal level. And this vulnerability is, is a real problem of the Eurozone. And the only way out uh, 
of this of this situation is to issue uh, joint bonds, kind of. So it's now it's now uh, called Corona bonds, which are issued by all the member states together in in a joint and mutual liability. It, once you have these bonds, then you have more or less the same playing field as in the United States or in Japan or in the UK. And so that and, and it's extremely important to create this this kind of conditions uh, for for the eurozone to survive this this crisis. But unfortunately, uh, in, in Germany, in the Netherlands, there is an extreme political opposition to this, which is really regrettable. And it's not only regrettable, it's also dangerous, because if we can't fight the crisis, the economic crisis, with the right economic therapies, of course, in addition to the health problems, we get also huge economic problems. And um, but, but last week, we had the meeting of the Euro finance ministers, the so-called Eurogroup, and the only thing that was agreed is that Italy can get some get access to the European stability mechanism, um, but it's only loans that Italy is is provided on its own account for which it has is, has, is responsible, and and the main problem of this approach is of course that the debt levels of Italy, which are already very high, will be even higher. And once hopefully the Corona crisis is over, then the markets will realize oh. Italy has now a debt burden of 160, 170% of GDP. This is not sustainable. And then after the Corona crisis, you will get a full blown uh, government debt crisis in Italy, which will then devastate uh, of what is left of the Italian economy. So it's really, really urgent that uh, we are able to convince policymakers in Europe that only a joint approach, a common approach uh, will save the Euro area. But, but so far, the, the willingness, especially of the German political elites, of the, of the, whether it's the chancellor or the vice chancellor or finance minister, uh, is extremely weak. And, and it it's, was, was from the very beginning very disappointing that when, when the crisis started, from the very outset, uh, the German policy, policymaker said, we do not want Corona bonds. That's, that's dangerous. We don't want it. And now, of course, it's very difficult to get rid uh, of this of this position and that's it's a real real threat economically but also politically for the eurozone because of course italy if if they if the italians see that in in such a terrible situation economically and also what what the health and and the and, and, and yeah the whole society is concerned that that the only thing the european partners are willing to provide is loans uh, and there's absolutely no willingness to make, really to support them in a, in, in a solidarity, as, 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 a, as, a, as a solidarity uh, group. Um, of course, then the anti-European anti uh, leaders uh, in, in Italy will say, okay, let's forget about the euro, let's forget about uh, Europe. Um, they are really only interested in our money, but not not in in our well-being. In uh, in our work with the Global Commission on Economic Transformation, uh, we uh, we talk about a number of things that are disruptive. Uh, you know, we've talked a little bit about climate and finance today. Uh, technology is another big theme. But one that I know uh, Joe Stiglitz and Danny Roderick are, are very concerned about, and I think we all share, is the notion of globalization and the notion of the nation state when many of the factors of production, financial capital, technology, can travel almost with the speed of light and people cannot shift to regions and across borders nearly as easily. Uh, I have seen a lot of work done over the last few years that is about the, what you might call maldistribution that comes from the advantage of certain factors relative to human beings. But I've also seen a kind of clarion call for global governance on things that are essentially like global public goods of, of which climate sits at the center. Do you see this pandemic 
being a, uh, a substantial influence in changing the way nations are organized in the context of a global economy? Yeah, this is a difficult question. First of all, uh, I would like to say that um, the crisis should not be taken now as an argument to reduce globalization, to reduce the international division of labor. Because I think this will definitely be associated with welfare losses for all uh, for all economies, uh, with all with all with all problems and negative side effects that globalization has. Overall, it increases the well-being of nations. I think that was a fundamental insight by Adam Smith, and I think this is still true. So, if we reduce globalization, we will have less wealth of nations. Um, but of course. Uh, Globalization needs needs governance, and and in order for globalization to really work for the well-being of all nations and all people in all nations, uh, you need global governance. I think that's that's quite obvious, and I think that's where almost all economists would agree. And well, after the Second World War, which not another even more catastrophic event. Uh, the, the global community realized that uh, only with global governance we can create a, a healthy uh, global economic system. So it was the Bretton Woods system, it was the World Bank, it was the, the GATT, it was the International Labour Organization. So this spirit uh, was there in, in, in the 1940s. And um, maybe as an optimistic scenario, we could say, well, if if there's really a huge challenge which has kind of devastating uh, impact on our societies that maybe then also there's an awakening uh, of 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 of, of uh, politicians of the elites that only with a with a global approach things can be uh, can be healed and 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 that the return to prosperity and also to to, and also that's the only way how we can can protect our climate. So I think this kind of enlightenment would, would be a positive scenario. But um, honestly, if you look at the political leaders so far in the United States, in the UK, in Brazil, in Russia, uh, I'm not so sure whether these guys uh, will be really uh, open for such an enlightenment. So, that, so that's, that's, yeah, so you would really need need a change uh, in 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 the mate in the leaders of of major nations in order to really to to achieve such an enlightenment and to get a kind of revival of this kind of Bretton Woods spirit uh, that was so important after the end of the Second World War. More more generally, more wide open. We've seen the which you might call bravado an audacity of people talking about how wonderful the world was and that technology would deliver us a much better standard of life and so forth. But at the same time, we've seen tremendous political discord. And when I look at these studies that were initiated, I believe, or at least brought to life in the eyes of economists by Case and Deaton on the diseases of despair and the geography of where those diseases are located and where the sources of economic disruption, automated, automation, machine learning, technical change, the impact of globalization, fiscal, local fiscal austerity, the economic disruptors are located in the same geography as these diseases of despair, but in an even deeper sense, it's the same location of where the vote for leave in Brexit, Marie Le Pen, the AFD, Donald Trump. So there is a despair, there's a despondency. And now we have this pandemic that has descended upon us. Is this going to just break the, what you might call the sense of ideas wide open? Are we going to re-envision or reconfigure society with all of this despair and all of these pressures, uh, which you might call unmasking the need for rethinking? Are we going to just 
devolve into a what you might call stale authoritarianism? How do you see it? And, and, and most hopefully, how do you see the conventional wisdom needing to change in light of what we've learned? Yeah, so there, again, two, two scenarios are possible. So if, if we see that uh, after, after this corona crisis, we have a lot of unemployed people, if we see that um, the incomes have come down, that people have lost a lot of money, um, so it, it could lead to a narrowing uh, of thinking that so kind of survive each country is just looking for for its own survival and um, and it will be probably more difficult to make a case for climate change for a more ju for more ju uh, more um, more equitable uh, distribution of of incomes so it, it, it could could go this way that, that it's just this kind of survival mode in, in in our societies for for the next few years up after this crisis um but as i said i think the the, sol sol the solution to most problems that with which our economies and and countries uh, have been dealing the last few years is the lack of a global governance uh, a global governance for climate policy a global governance for for tax uh, standards a global governance for labor standards uh, global governance for competition policy um, i think that Without this global governance, uh, you have the problem that each country that, that each country is going its own way. It's trying maybe to to um, underbid other countries with with climate standards, with labor standards, and so on. So, I think we, we would really need this kind of renaissance, revival of a bread and wood spirit. That only if we act together, we can solve the problems, not only of the world but also the problems of our own countries. And I think this. So, if, if, as, as I said, it if, if you take the precedence of the Second World War, so if a real disaster happens, maybe it also opens the minds for people to see things in a different way. And so that would be my optimistic scenario that we somehow uh, will get the kind of yeah, bread and wood spirit. And in the, uh, it, how would I say, in the academic world, do you see a revival of how would I say, the importance of governance? I, what I've seen in recent years is not what you might call the traditional dilemma, say at the time of the New Deal, should government be empowered or should the markets be empowered? It's actually, particularly in the United States, gotten worse where people say, well, the, the government exists, but it's captured by the rent-seeking and the money power of large corporations in relation to small citizens, or in the event of plutocrats and billionaires compared to the average citizen. That what I call commodification of social design has taken over and demoralized many people about the capacity for government to serve them. And when I bring up this question of globalization that you just uh, were so lucid in discussing. A lot of the cynicism that I hear is, well, if you have a big global government way up there in the tower, they won't feel or be sensitive to anything that is happening locally. But I think the counterpoint to that is, if you're right down there in the turf and you can feel where the people are suffering, you may not have the tools because how would I say, the scope of the market is larger than the domain of the sovereign. And the things that affect you, you have no influence or control over unless you create a unified global government where everything, which you might call, is under one roof of authority. But I think I think this, this question of the reinvigoration of the importance or role of governance is a big one. And I, I was involved in a presentation this morning in memory of the life of Paul Volcker. And the last thing he did was form something called the Volcker Alliance. And the Volcker Alliance about was dedicated to that, what I will call the restoration of trust in governance. And he thought that that was the missing ingredient. He wasn't here, obviously, he passed away last year before the the pandemic. But, but I, I just... 
uh, with the cynicism about governance, it concerns me a great deal where the impetus will come from to revive it. So, well, I think that, that in this regard, uh, the corona crisis could really has a, have a positive impact. Um, look at the situation in, in, in the health sectors uh, of the economy. So in Germany, for many years, or almost yeah, for many, many years, there was a complaint that Germany has way too much, many hospital beds. Uh, in fact, in German, Germany has nine hospital beds per thousand inhabitants. In Spain, Italy, they have three. I think the United States also something like three. So, so it, for many years, uh, the statistics were shown and saying, look, way too much, way too many hospital beds in, in Germany. Uh, and of course, now today we see that in Germany, uh, the death rate of corona diseases is among the lowest uh, of, of all countries. And so I think people will, will see that um, the market is not, uh, not the solution for all problems and that it's, it's good to have a government uh, that is able to deal uh, with, such, with such emergencies uh, because the, the market will not, uh, will not uh, provide you uh, additional hospital beds that are probably not needed in, in normal periods of time. Uh, and so I think this is maybe can also lead to rethinking that we can see, okay, in areas where we had in mean, countries where the, where the government was, was, was stronger and was, was interfering more like in Germany in the, in the, uh, in the, in the health sector, they were much better able to deal with the crisis than countries with, with the very weak and, and, uh, they are pressed from austerity uh, health system. So I think to ask this balance between state and market, I think the, I think there the consensus will be much stronger uh, that we cannot rely on the market to deal uh, with all with all uh, emergencies. So we need the government, a strong government, and government that has enough money uh, to fulfill its role in protecting uh, its, its people in, in emergencies. Well, as they often say, uh, necessity is the mother of, what is it? What's the thing? Uh, the necessity is the mother of invention. And we yeah. do have necessity now. We do have a challenge and we cannot afford as a society, and I'm thinking at the world level now, to be neglectful or, or not rise to this challenge. So in that respect, I think your, your sense of hopefulness is a good one and very, uh, very much on target. Well, Peter, it's been lovely to explore with you today. As always, I look forward to continuing to work with you in the uh, Commission on Global Economic Transformation. And uh, please keep us posted as you put out new and you know further insights and reports. I know you publish a lot of things for at the uh, CEPR, Center for Economic Policy Research in Europe. And uh, I'm sure we'll get back together again on this podcast after a few months have passed and we have a chance to look at it from a different vantage point. But thanks for being here today. Yeah, thank you very much, Rob. It was a real pleasure to talk to you. And I hope that when we had a positive and a negative scenario, that in the end, the positive uh, scenarios will materialize. Well, I think that's the reason to explore both sides, because then the path that we want becomes much more evident in that positive dimension. And check out more from the Institute for New Economic Thinking at ineteconomics.org.